Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this, the autumn launch of Index on Censorship magazine. Um, and, and very interesting issue to put together, um, I would say, as the editor, and hopefully um, you've had time to find out about some of the articles. If not, please do. Um, there's some really fascinating pieces in there. Um, we've got some of the authors here today, um, and some of them are on their way still. Um, but I'd like to thank all of them for their contributions and their hard work. Um, the inspiration behind the special report in this issue was about ignored, censored, and suppressed voices. And uh, we looked at different stories from around the world, from India to South Africa to Brazil to China, um, and from lots of different perspectives, from women from, uh, who felt excluded from public life, uh, gay groups in South Africa and the abuse that they were suffering, uh, poor, um, poor uh, in Brazil, in the favelas, and how they were using technology to create their own media because they'd lost faith in the mainstream media. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of stories that I think tie in with the theme tonight and um, what uh, Sarah Brown is going to be talking about. Um, one of which is uh, a story from India written for us by three brilliant women authors about the planning of cities in India and how the, the planning of a city can end up excluding certain people and how women can end up feeling excluded, not part of the city or not able to have access to all of the city by the way the planning is done. One point they made there in the article was about women's toilets, women's public toilets closing at 9 p.m. And the signal that that sent to women, that that meant they weren't expected to be out after 9 p.m. And the lack of security and the implications of that. Um, so do dip into that story if you've got time. Um, there's another brilliant story by Jemiah Steinfeld, who is, I think, on her way here and due to join us later, um, about uh, rural, r rural people in China and how they become second-class citizens when they move to cities. Um, they lose a lot of their rights. They end up unable to get free education for their kids, unable to access health care. So um, we've, there's a lot of brilliant stories, and, I, and I'm not going to mention them all here, but do dip into the magazine and, um, and catch more of them. The, the evening tonight is going to kick off with um, a speech by Sarah Brown, and that will be followed by a Q&A um, led by Helen Lewis, the deputy editor of The New Statesman. So let me just introduce Sarah Brown. I'm sure I don't really need to, but as many of you will know her very well, um, she is going to be talking, uh, focusing particularly on the, w the necessary work on women and girls and education around the world. Um, you may have seen her part of her work on um, Malala Day, which was beamed around the world. Um, and uh, we, we, um, we would like to welcome her here today. So, Sarah, would you join us on the stage? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, th thanks, Rachel, very much. Um, those are the scariest stairs. I'm not looking forward to going back down them later. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here this evening, but I'm also really delighted to be here at Lillian Bayless Technology School. I went to school in North London, but my first flat was just down the road from here, and I know just how hard everyone at this school has worked, from it becoming the first in Lambeth to get an outstanding in its Ofsted, and now stands out as outstanding in all aspects, which places it amongst the top 10% of schools, secondary schools in the country. Being named for a pioneering woman like Lillian Bayless, who nurtured some of the most amazing talent in theatre, in opera, and in the ballet world, has left her mark all across London. And I think it gives the students here quite a lot to live up to. But clearly, uh, having met with a group of um, fifth formers, as I still call them, um, earlier this evening, um, I can see that they've got that talent coming out of here. The new issue of the magazine for Index on Censorship that they're launching this evening has also highlighted some really, really talented voices, as Rachel was saying, and some really courageous ones too. Like all of the magazine, magazine editions, it's distinguished by the quality of its writing, but also the bravery of its stance. And this one, for me, is particularly important because of the priority it's placed amongst its pages on the voices of women, 
from the pioneering feminists writing about women's safety in India to the stories of female resistance and of hope from the Arab Spring. This magazine gives a megaphone to the people whose contribution is so often marginalized or ignored or eliminated altogether. So in the spirit of Index on Censorship's core values, the power of our voices is the theme of my remarks this evening. And I want to start by updating a feminist slogan that lots of women who have done pioneering work on role models have been using for years. Their view is, if she can see it, she can be it. In other words, if you have a visible role model, you're much more likely to keep fighting to get past all of the hurdles that are still too often put in the way of girls and women, just as they are for people who are disabled or LGBT or BMME or hold a forbidden political viewpoint living somewhere in one of the harshest regimes around the world. If you can see it, you can be it. I very much think that's true, the importance of strong, visible women role models. Even my own sense of what's impossible for me was determined by watching women, whether it's my own mother as she you know, ran an infant school in the 1970s in, in, in the middle of Africa and then went on you know, recent years to complete her PhD in her 70s and has just embarked on a new project, she tells me, where she's now um, leading a research project on the study of quilt makers, mostly women, and the stories that they tell. And the, I think of other role models, if I think back to sort of the, the icons of my teenage years, which for me were people like um, the rock artist and poet Patti Smith, or the writer Jill Tweedy, or the American feminist Gloria Steinem. And now today, I get through my work to meet some extraordinary women, people like Grasa Michelle or Aung San Suu Kyi, President Joyce Banda of Malawi, and other younger women like Ashwini Angadi, who was born blind in a poor rural community in India, has fought her way for her own education, graduating from Bangalore University with outstanding grades, and then gave up quite a successful job in IT to campaign for the rights of young people with disabilities. And then I find myself at the UN a month ago speaking alongside her. So I agree that that visibility really counts. If I think of my role models, they're all women who never give up raising their voices, who make a career literally of speaking up. And I want to update that old slogan with a rather more disturbing thought and suggest tonight that if you can hear her, you will fear her. I should explain what I mean. From Nigeria to Egypt to Yemen and Afghanistan to the richest countries of the West, we're seeing the rise of targeted attacks focused on women who use their voice to speak out for other women. Sometimes these attacks are physical, and I'll talk more about them in a moment. But here in the UK, there has been a spate of attacks which are verbal and online, and which are perpetrated by men who fear women. From the disgusting rape threats directed at Caroline Corrado Perez for daring to suggest that a woman should remain on British banknotes, to the horrendous and sexualized verbal violence that was meted out to Mary Beard after she appeared on Question Time, to the model Katie Piper, who's had to find her own voice speaking up for the stigma of disfiguration in response to the acid attack on her and creating her own, going out there with her own defiant new beauty at the hands of her NHS sur surgeon and speaking up for others who she finds are, are suffering that stigma that she's discovered. And of course, the all too prevalent victims of domestic violence who get a collective voice through organizations like Women's Aid and the main refuges around the UK who speak up more when they can see it can even happen to a goddess like Nigella. It's clear that the public square and too often the private home simply doesn't provide a safe environment for Britain's women. If anybody doubts how bad things have got, I'd encourage you to go and take a look at Laura Bates's work with the Everyday Sexism Project, an online directory of harassment, discrimination, and abuse submitted by over 50,000 women who are shouting back. It paints a picture of a Britain in which violence and the threat of violence against women is so routine. Women have almost ceased to notice it as a crime and as an outrage until a platform came along that gave their problem visibility and with it importance. I want to suggest that a public square which is so hostile to women that they don't feel they can participate in it without inviting overwhelming abuse is itself a form of censorship. It might not be the same process as smashing up a newspaper office or burning a book 
or even shooting teenage girls on a school bus. But the effect is the same, that of silencing a voice which has the right to be heard. And if you want further evidence of, how, of hearing how women's voices can terrify those who risk losing their power, just consider how the worst misogynists in the world were afraid of just three little words. The words I'm talking about weren't said by somebody famous. They weren't said by somebody powerful. They hadn't even been planned before they were uttered, but they awoke the world. Malala Yousafzai, as a schoolgirl from rural Pakistan, had published her youthful diary, detailing how life had changed for girls after the Taliban took over her mountain town. She and her friends Shazia and Kainat spent the next few years campaigning for girls to be allowed to return to school, although they knew how dangerous speaking out against the Taliban could be. Malala even talked in interviews about how they might try and kill her for it. So literally just over a year ago um, today, I think last week was, was the anniversary which coincided with the International Day of the Girl Child, this worst imagining happened and Malala was targeted by a Taliban assassin. He boarded the school bus, identified Malala, shot her in the head and also injured Shazia and Kainat sitting either side of her. And as the footage of Malala's airlift to safety was broadcast, young women used just three words to claim their solidarity and support with her. I am Malala. She and her two friends are all now safely in the UK and continuing their education. And as the world's gaze has given them some safety, the campaign continues with a growing movement of young people, all of whom are role models for every child around the world. Whether in school or waiting for the dream to come true, and the opportunity of learning to come to them too. It's such a powerful reminder of a question I first asked myself some time ago. Why is the most terrifying thing for the Taliban a girl with a book? Or for that matter, the terrifying group in Nigeria, Boko Haram, who are firebombing schools and dormitories while students sleep. Boko Haram, the name literally means Western education is evil. These terrorists know, better than we do, that a girl with an education is the most formidable force for freedom in the world. A girl who can read and write and argue can be brutalized and oppressed. She can be bought and sold. She can be discriminated against and denied her rights. But she cannot, in the end, be stopped. Girls like Malala and Kainat and Shania and other, Shazia and others, in the end, will prevail. And it's why they hate them so. And it seems to me that if a girl like Malala, on her own, can inspire so much fear, then imagine what she can do if she's backed by a movement of hundreds of millions. It's why I believe that the efforts to achieve global education are at the heart of how we unlock the potential of every young citizen. As children learn, they achieve understanding, tolerance, opportunity, and the chance to contribute to a better world. Reaching girls is at the heart of this, and we need to do so much better for girls. Right now, there are 57 million children missing from school. 57 million of our younger selves missing out on the education which could transform not just their lives, but our world. 31 million are girls, and of those at school, many millions more are not learning. Girls are also just not getting the same number of school years as their own brothers, to the detriment of everyone. New research has shown that providing universal education in developing countries can lift their economic growth rates by up to 2% a year. It's a tiny number that makes a very, very big difference. And the results are starkest of all when it comes to educating girls. All the evidence shows that for every extra year of education you give a girl, you raise her children's chances of living past five years old. Because education, educated mums are more likely to immunize their kids, get them the health care they need, etc. Educated girls are more likely to stay AIDS free. They're less vulnerable to sexual exploitation by adults. They marry later. They have future, fewer children. They're more likely to educate their children in turn. Perhaps most importantly of all, education increases a girl's chance of well-paid employment in later life. And the evidence suggests that female earners are more likely to spend their wages to the benefit of their children and community than the traditional male heads of the household. And the benefits, of course, don't always stay just on a community level. They can sometimes have national and even global implications too. Because if you look at the women 
who have been in leading positions in every continent around the world, from Sonia Gandhi to Grassa Michel to Dilma Rousseff in Brazil to Joyce Banda, they've all got one thing in common. They all have an above average level of education. And it's why one of my new mantras is now, the women who lead, read. If we want better politics, a politics of pluralism and freedom of expression around the world, then it begins with empowering women and that begins with educating them. There are plenty of good reasons to invest in education and learning for every child. But the best bit is that we've already promised to. We're not advocating for a new pledge, simply for the fulfillment of one that's already been made. In the year 2000, world leaders committed to getting every child in school by 2015 as part of the ambitious targets we call the Millennium Development Goals. World leaders have already signed the contract they just need to deliver the goods. So for me, the argument about whether we should invest in education to get those 57 million children into school and is a bit of a no-brainer. For me, there's no question that closing the gender gap in education should be the priority. As soon as people hear the facts, they tend to stop asking whether we should do it and start to focus on whether we can. It's a fair question, and people will always want to probe whether we can make a difference to decisions taken hundreds of thousands of miles away. It's a question I've asked myself a lot too, but I take heart from two things. Firstly, we know that progress is possible, even on seemingly very big problems, because we've made it happen before. You can look at the big changes of the last century, from the end of slavery to achieving the vote for women to the end of apartheid, all started as impossible calls for change, but change did come. Enough voices gathered together calling for the same thing so that even a politician couldn't fail to hear the call. And then if politicians are minded to change it anyway, they can do so when they have that kind of a strong mandate behind them. Even campaigns I've contributed to, and I'm sure many of you have too, from Drop the Debt to Make Poverty History to the Maternal Mortality Campaign, brought big changes. But I've heard firsthand what happens at the start. It's too big an ask, it can't be done in the time, it's too costly. But enough free voices calling for action and give it a little bit of time and a lot of noise and change comes. Less than 10 years ago, there were over 500,000 women dying every year in pregnancy and childbirth, unwitnessed, unacknowledged, unnoticed by political leaders who held the power to save those lives. Today, thanks to the collective voices of those who cared enough through the White Ribbon Alliance and others, that number is a whopping 47% lower. And the work to reduce it further continues at the highest levels. And out in the most remote rural areas where the message is sometimes hard to reach, there's work going on to make sure that that work reaches there too. A 47% drop in the numbers of mothers dying, it's not just a, a number, you know, it, it's the thousands of dads living with the loves of their lives who would otherwise have a broken heart no one else could mend. Thousands of big brothers and sisters who don't need to fear that in gaining a new member of the family, they've risked losing an old one. And thousands of babies being nursed to sleep tonight by the person who loves them most in the world and who has survived to love them as they grow. This stuff works. Campaigning is the key for all of us lucky enough to be able to use our own voices. And on education, I'm hopeful we can get even further than we have with the maternal mortality campaign and achieve all of those goals by 2015. It is incredibly ambitious. It means getting 57 million in children into school in less than two years. Gordon and I have decided that we will devote the next years of our lives to this and will be judged, of course, by the results. But increasing awareness is an enormous part of it. If the numbers of children getting a high quality education does not increase in leaps and bounds in the years to come, then actually we collectively will all have failed. Thankfully, we have a lot of help. When Gordon was appointed the United Nations Secretary General Special Envoy of Education, the weight of the UN system has been added to the cause. And business leaders have come on board to the Global Business Coalition on Education that I'm fortunate to chair. And I'm pleased that the religious leaders have agreed to form a faith coalition to mobilize the faith, co faith communities, as has happened so powerfully for debt relief and for make poverty history in the past. But most significantly, younger people are lining up for this as ambassadors, as spokespersons, as online champions and community mobilizers. The 600 strong 
group of youth leaders from the digital platform A World at School who assembled at the UN on Malala Day in July are all now engaging with their networks, supported by NGOs from all around the world. And the digital platform for this is growing rapidly. The consistent messages, the constant call for action, the rising volume is starting to make a difference. From Syrian refugee children needing a place for school right now to the young girls who want to study before they marry in Yemen or Nigeria or Bangladesh, to child workers who've never been inside a classroom, the momentum for them is growing. And this grand confluence of forces is powered by the single most important driver of change. Every individual who cares enough to take up an action, whether it's just a tweet or a Facebook post or more, it includes you. Because if we can't mobilize millions of so-called ordinary people to do hundreds of extraordinary things, then the governments of the world will conclude that the pledge that they made to get every child into school can be allowed to just quietly slip away, that the pledge on gender equality can be ignored, that the pledge to keep every child safe from violence, from trafficking, or from finding their own voice just disappears. It would be a tragedy not just for the millions of children whose lives continue to be destroyed, but for the notion of progress itself. If we can't even rely on our leaders to do that which they have promised to do, can we rely on them to do all that we need them to do? I don't want my children to grow up in a generation of cynics, a whole group of people who think the promises don't get kept and politics doesn't really work. I want them to see and to know that if we make a promise, particularly a promise to a child, that we keep it that when we see an injustice, we write it, and that when we're presented with an opportunity, we seize it, and that when we have the chance to change the world, that there's nothing that we won't do to see that potential fulfilled. That, for me, is the ambitious spirit of activism which Index on Censorship embodies, and the one that we must now bring to bear in ensuring that the girls and women of the world learn first how to read and then how to lead. This is the chance of our generation and I hope that you, like me, think it's one that we must grasp with both hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech. I suppose I find it interesting that we're talking about, particularly if we start with the UK, online abuse and free speech, mm -hmm. because the way I tend to hear about that is any kind of curbs on online speech isn't that restricting free speech. So how do you counter that argument, that people are simply exercising their democratic right to be vile to women online? Uh, they are exercising their democratic right to be vile, but I think that it's important that many more voices go back and say that sort of behavior is not acceptable. So I don't think, actually, even if you think of everything that was happening through this summer where people were calling out trolls to come out from their lurking caves, it was really about asking people to come out and, and show who they were. I mean, a lot of this abuse that uh, moves around on the bottom of articles on newspaper sites, on, you know, on Twitter, is people who are going under an assumed name, and, you know, a, a jokey image from, from their point of view, and, you know, and off they go, hiding behind an, you know, an anonymous... Um, and anonymity. So I think, first of all, to call it out so that it's visible doesn't deprive people of their rights. They're not made unsafe by exposing who they are. And secondly, mobilizing enough other voices to make a different point of view clear. And the other thing is that you've talked about some quite grim things in your speech, but mm -hmm. do you feel optimistic? Do you feel that you're pushing on a, on a door that is, that is moving? I think it's moving whether I'm pushing on that door or not. I, f I feel like there's a very big growing momentum. I think the most powerful group through it is, what is, is the voices of young people. I think they do have the, the open space that, that, that uh, online media offers them and different ways to explain what they're feeling and what you're finding is really, really strong common themes. You know, we've seen it in North Africa. We've seen it across the Middle East. We see it as it moves to different places. But I think people are, young people are starting to recognize that when they're sitting inside their own classrooms, that they don't feel like a powerful voice. But when they see a much bigger community, they're, they're quick to add their voice and create that movement. So that, I think, is, 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 is growing. And I've been on that other side of seeing what it feels like on the inside of government, where if the call is simple enough and clear enough and consistent enough and enough people doing it, trust me, politicians don't miss hearing it. 
You know, it's when it's too muddled and it's too many versions of it or it comes in, in waves. But all that does is give you the confidence to know that if you keep going and keep it loud, that you will get heard and you can make that difference. And that's something that I thought was very interesting in your speech, talking about your sons not growing up as, as cynics, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the young people here today, how do you think, what's the way to enthuse them about politics? Because that's all we hear again and again. You know, these are people who'd rather be on their Xboxes than you know, going out. And I'm not sure how that true that is, but what, what can you do to enthuse you know, young people? People like a bit of Xbox time or a bit of whatever it is they're into. Do. You know, but it's that thing of then what happens once, once you go off and do other things. Young people have always been about meeting with each other and talking to each other and con connecting with each other, whether it's on phones or you know, m meeting at the bus stop or ho however it happens. So the online space just gives a whole another area for them. Um, how everything tells you that people are fed up with politicians, fed up with political parties, fed up with the political process, fed up with the, the dynamic between the media and politicians in both directions. That's the thing that I think can tip younger people into being quite cynical about what politics offer them. That's not to me what politics is about. It isn't about that group dynamic. It's about the opportunity you have as a, a democratic elected person to make very real differences to people's lives and never losing that connection for people to know that they have that right to have that communication with elected political leadership and to make clear what they want done. I was talking earlier with the, with the students here and they immediately moved into the area of politics, immediately went to highlighting Margaret Thatcher as the only um, woman prime minister um, in the UK, but, but as a history topic, which you know, I, I felt was quite aging. But, um, but, the, <laughs> but they, what they were saying was that they didn't know how what they were doing could make that difference or whether anything you know, they engaged in made that difference. So I think it's understanding that where, where you can shout out for something, where you can see that change. And remembering what I was trying to highlight when I was talking was how many examples from, you know, the last hundred years where big causes have been set up, everyone said it can't happen, and look at change comes. Yeah, I mean, who do you see as a role model in that sense? Who do you look to when you think about your role models? For campaigners, well, if you think of people who are at the forefront of the anti-apartheid movement, if people are at the forefront of the feminist movement, um, even if you go back to when we were campaigning for the vote, but through my time it was people campaigning for an awful lot of firsts, first woman CEO, first, you know, w w women ministers. For, you know, it's all those glass ceiling breakers is, is the generation I've lived through. Now I think it's different where you've got a few, a few in every, you know, in, in most lines of work, but it's trying to make it the norm for women as well as men to be able to engage in that. They call that the 30% um, problem, I think, don't they? So women get to 30% in a certain kind of, in a profession, and then people go, it's full of women. There's just anything too many women at this point. But as you say, we're still 22% I mean, of female parliamentarians, for example. Um, and to zoom it out a little bit to the international stage, you talked about the Millennium Development Goals, mm -hmm. and those are very clearly set out. What's mm -hmm. holding them back? Some of them made very good early progress. Education was one that made very early progress, and then there was a sort of box ticked and, and, and let go of the rest of it. The health goals have made great progress, and I think that will carry on, but they've had very big champions. You know, you've got Bill Gates and Warren Buffett in the health space. You've got um, governments who've been able to see that difference with a big HIV AIDS drive, malaria drive. That, I think, then becomes more sophisticated because it doesn't really work in those sort of silos where education's here and health is here and environment's here. So at some point, we get to the point where we get to join those things up. Why I think they've not reached it is that you need more political win in the system and, and more behind making them achievable. I think we're a little bit too ready to go, oh, 2015's coming up down the track quickly. What's our new goals going to look like? I think we've made promises to achieve these goals, and we need to. I think it's important to keep those promises, but also it... it they were made for a reason. They're the, pr they're the things that need to be done. We do have to have that gender equality. We do have to have those health improvements. We do have to have every child in school. And um, probably the hardest group of people to enthuse about these kind of things, journalists. Mm -hmm. Journalists are notoriously resistant to writing about development, about foreign stories generally, because mm -hmm. it's perceived to be something that doesn't interest people. What have you found to be the most effective ways of engaging the media and therefore getting those stories out to people? Um, volume and noise that people make. Journalists will always hear loud volume, I think. And also uh, the efforts of young, younger people. I think at the moment journalists seem to be interested in what younger people are doing and where different groups are undertaking something that's quite interesting or quite dynamic or you know, it generates stories for journalists. 
as far I understand it, you'll know better than I do, journalists are interested in stories. So it's not whether they are or aren't interested in development, it's whether they think it's an interesting enough story. No, I agree with you, and I think that's why Malala's story, for example, has captivated people, because you see the image of a, of a small girl and a big, you know, scary gunman on a bus, and you see the injustice immediately mm -hmm. in that. But I worry with, with Malala, is there a danger in heaping too much pressure on her and in, in turning people into icons, essentially? Um, always, I think, but I think, you know, if, if you meet somebody like Malala and also the, fr the friends that are around her, her friends have taken longer to, you know, adjust into it. They weren't as thrust into the spotlight as they were. Their priority is finishing their own education, so I think there's that balance. So I think you've got quite a big Malala flurry at the moment because you've got an anniversary, she's got a book out and those things. But then I think it's going to be, you know, GCSEs like everyone, every other 16-year-old. So I think the family support that she has around her gives her that... Um, gives her that moment to actually get on and be able to lead her own life and the, and the school support that she has. So as I understand it, you, they're making those choices to carry on campaigning and be part of providing a voice. And it has been very extreme for her. But it's like all famous moments. I don't think they last at that, that level all the time. So. And my final question before I throw it open to mm. anybody on the floor is if, if people were going to go away from tonight and do one thing, mm -hmm. what's the one thing that you would say, do that first? I think the one thing, f if, if it's for the point of view of what you do as an individual, is the thing that you are most passionate about is the thing that you should always remember to take action with and to remember that giving voice to what th that thing you care about is the thing that matters and joining into something collectively so it becomes a louder voice. If I could direct you what it is, because you haven't quite decided what you're passionate about, I would say logging into the world at school work or looking at that global education work is something that's got a very big growing momentum at the moment and there's a very real opportunity of being able to deliver schooling for those people who are missing out. And I will ask at this point whether or not um, we do have a microphone going around, so if there anybody would like to put their hand up. Whether or not we have a question. Oh, once we've stolen the microphone. Lady in the second row. Hi, I thought that was a great speech. Um, I just wanted to ask, I suppose, it's quite complicated because I think you're right about everything you say, but how do you address the idea that whilst you're absolutely right about campaigning for women, mm -hmm. how do you work when there is more money and far more media attention put on if you like, the opposite of that. So as an example, there's more traffic and more media, sort of social internet working about, I can't even remember her name properly, Miley Cyrus, mm -hmm. than there is about sort of big issues. And how do you sort of think that as an individual you can try and affect a change in the way that it always feels like there's a lot of campaigning but they just don't have the same power or influence in terms of how much airtime or how much media time they can get. I think the fact that you've identified Miley Cyrus, Miley Cyrus actually sparked off a whole debate that was less about sort of the musical quality of her performance than it, than it was about a lot of the issues around feminism and, and body image for, for young women today. So actually it generated quite a valid dialogue that I think as a sort of small feminist group, you couldn't have bought that kind of publicity for a subject around you know, body image and, and how, how teen, teen girls work. So I think... Those sort of examples are things where you can engage in what's happening with the topics that are interesting and just shift the focus of the discussion. But your, uh, your other point was, what do you do when there's more money and more um, effort and energy going behind big marketing initiatives than there ever is behind the good causes? I don't think that's a reason to stop doing it. You know, I was engaged with the maternal mortality campaign during the years when it was, you know, the moment where you roll, roll the snowball up the hill. And the cost of running that campaign every single year was 300,000 pounds a year. That was it, that was all that was in the budget for a global campaign. And yet, it's resulted in you know over 200,000 lives a year being saved. And that was about sitting down and working out who were the people in the world that could make a difference. You know, and in that instance, it was working out that there was a group of political leaders who were going to sit around a table at the G8 and were going to make decisions about the Millennium Development Goals, and there was a, it was not even on the agenda. So if you only have to be heard by eight people, you know who you're writing to and you know who you're talking to. So some of it, you don't necessarily need everybody doing something to make that difference if your resources are smaller. It's about targeting what you're trying to do and you know, keeping your eye on that you know, while listening to you, Miley Cyrus. 
And, and to follow that up, what campaigns that you've been involved with have you learned from something that you didn't expect, were you surprised by? Um, I think that the great lesson of the Make Poverty History campaign was that it ran concurrently with the notion of everyone understanding that every activity and even individuals can be a brand. And so Make Poverty History was invented as a brand that all the NGOs and activists could come behind. And the, the take takeaway from that at the end was you got these big outcomes at the Glen Eagles meetings and these big commitments, so that was a win for the campaign, but, but it didn't need to exist after that. And a huge amount of an effort was put into a name and brand building. And what I learned from that was actually if every single activist and NGO has their own brand, that's the big thing that's changing. Every individual has their own Facebook page, their own brand, their own name, their own... Every NGO wants to work and put their effort into being Save the Children and Oxfam and Amnesty and, you know, Index on Censorship will be Index on Censorship. You need to work within a space that allows everybody to be that. And I think that's been the big learning curve of these last few years for campaigning is how you campaign around a single core ask but allow everyone to, be, to do it under their own banner. And you're huge on Twitter, which is something I'm personally very um, admiring of. How useful do you find that as a, as a campaigning tool? Does it, does it generate what people always say, clicktivism, you know, this idea that people sort of retweet something? No, I've not heard that expression. Yeah. Nice. Um, or, or do you, I mean, how, how does it work? How do you feel that it, that it drives people to the campaigns you care about? Um, I used Twitter originally because I was a bit nervous about doing direct interviews with members of the media because I just was always concerned that I wouldn't, what I wanted to say wouldn't necessarily be what other people ended up reading. And that, that bond of trust for us, for understandable reasons, it now turns out, with the media just didn't exist. So I took the risk of using Twitter as a way to say, I can just put out what I'm doing because I recognize I was in a position while we were in government of where you're, you, you're operating in a public space and there's a part of you that needs to put some of that in the public domain. So I couldn't just hide away and not do anything. So Twitter became that for me. As I understand it for everybody else, it just became a really good way to be a bit nosy and have a look and see what was going on, and, um, which, al which also worked. It was a sort of meet meeting in the middle from it. But the campaigning side has grown through that. But it, it's getting that balance where you're on Twitter because you're you, not because you are the campaign or the message. So I've always had to keep a balance between just chirping away and hoping there are enough people that want to follow and listen to that and being able to put out campaign information. But I do get a very big pickup from it and sometimes we'll get a bigger pickup from it than if it's published in a newspaper and you get a response that way because it's very easy that. and very Don't measurable. Don't tell people that. Um, that's you know, putting us out of a job, certainly. But no, I find that very, very interesting because it's about, it's about sharing something of yourself but also giving people you know, stuff that's themed around a cause. Mm -hmm. Has it changed since you left Downing Street what you feel that you can say and how you approach it? Um, no, not, not, not massively, actually. Um, because it was only ever me, and still to this day is only ever me that does Twitter, th th you have to have a self edit. I don't know if anyone's indulging in Bridget Jones's new diaries, but she has discovered Twitter, let me tell you. And um, it's that thing of just don't press send without thinking through what you're sending. There's a you know, great chapter on you know, a night of drunken tweeting, and I've ne never succumbed to, succumbed to that, but it's... You've, you've got to say something that you're happy to, you know, write something, something you're going to read later. So I did, I did make mistakes with it. I did cross over into lines. We were on a, a, a government trip once. We're bouncing around Europe where every single meal was veal. And um, I ended up tweeting, you know, what is it with the Europeans and veal? And, um, you know, vegetarian food for me again or something. And had every single veal farmer that you could ev ever exist wrote me a letter explaining why I was terribly wrong to do that. But it was... It, you, you just realise you're straying into somebody else's territory. I'm, I'm, I would be allowed to... I think if I tweeted that now, no, no farmer would write to me. You, you're not, you know, bouncing into policy territory or treading on someone's, yeah. you know, the agriculture minister's toes there. So those sort of things I wouldn't have to worry about so much now, but I didn't commit too many of those, really. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, are there, does anyone else have a question? Um, lady right at the back. Um, thanks very much for your speech. Um, I just wondered, um, it's great that you've spoken about female empowerment and women mm -hmm. leading, and I just wondered how you felt being framed, particularly in the media, as wife of oh, yeah. the leader. 
No, my favorite question I ever asked was going on a, um, a radio interview and uh, they said, so what's it like to have given up work? And you're like, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, and the, the other one was, was being asked by somebody where they said, you know, you always came across as, you know, being able to be quite a normal person and quite accessible person. So what's it like, Sarah, to be so ordinary? <laughs> and you're like, um, well, you know, it's like, but the wife of thing, and always your age if you're a woman, and always mother of, you know. But, you know, the, these are the things in the media that it's, it's the little things that define women in a way that men are never spoken of in that way. I've lived with the sort of wife of thing, um, and you, to me, you just carry on and do the things that you do. You know, there's a sort of, it's not the worst thing I've had said about me, to be honest. And um, it's not, you know, we've lived through, you know, plenty, plenty of other things that get hurled at you. It's that thing of getting up in the morning and knowing what you're about and knowing what you're there to do and sort of cracking on with it. But the wife off thing, it, it just doesn't give you a space to describe yourself in any other way. So for me, things like Twitter, things like being able to write my own blog, you can actually describe yourself the way you want to be described and give yourself your own voice too. And the other thing about Twitter is it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of essential authenticity about yourself that you have to have. You can't go on it. If you go on it too much and try and pretend to be a something or style yourself in a certain way, it, it, it's not something that then resonates with a lot of people that want to hear you. So being genuinely the way you are and who you are, I think, is the thing that makes people follow you on Twitter. So when you then get the labels that come that say your wife of and your, um, you, you still have a cle clearer, the, the, the sort of the volume of who you are and, and your own clear voice can come through. Did it ever give you pause about being involved in work, particularly campaigning about women and girls, because you thought, you know, because a lot of high-flying women feel like, I don't want to draw attention to the fact that I'm a woman, everyone's already doing that enough for me. Uh, no, but maybe, may, I mean, maybe it's a reflection of, you know, the, the times that I've grown, grown up in, you know, I went to school through the 70s and 80s, and feminism was an a very important important thing and you don't lose that just because it dips out of fashion and comes back in so defining your yourself and, and speaking up for girls and women I think is a really Im important thing so I've never lost that um, but it but it moves around with how popular it is to be that mm. and do we have one more question lady oh there in the Hi, um, you've talked a lot about um, the role that education can play mm -hmm. in, in women's rights, but I just wondered why, why you thought in the UK, somewhere where there are women are very, very highly educated, mm -hmm. why there's so much anger still today against women who, who speak in public, and women in the media, women journalists who talk out about women's issues. Do I understand why there is? No, I don't know that I do understand why there is, but but what's noticeable is that that anger exists. I think if you really boil it down, it probably comes down to quite a small minority of people, the vast, vast majority being men, but there is also the smaller group of women who seem very angry about other women, who's, which creates a really confusing um, sort of con contribution to the debate. Women are highly educated, but we still have quite a long way to go with getting that gender equality for the opportunities that you have as you come out of school, as you, you know, make opportunities for, for what you're going on to be. So I think we still have a bit of work to do in this country here. S something about it seems to threaten a, a, a group of mostly men. Um, and the other bit of it, of course, is the issues around violence, so that it's less about, um, you know, education or about opportunity, and it's directly about violence you know, whether that's verbalized violence or physical violence. And that's something I think we've got everywhere in the world. We have an awful lot of work to do. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for that speech and for talking to me as well. I'd, I'd like to also say thank you to Index on Censorship and to the Lillian Baylor School and their headmaster, Gary Phillips. And um, we'd also like to thank Helen and Sarah for being with us today. Thank you very much.